I'm sorry I can't be as dramatic or over dramatic as excited with the uh, patent that Alex talked woo there. But welcome everybody to the final Sabres post game edition of I'll Hang Up and Listen, brought to you by Fatty Beer Company, Western New York's premier market and tap room with over 300 beers to choose from at eight Western New York locations. Fatty Beer is one of Western New York's only kid and dog friendly bars with live music and entertainment at all eight locations from 11.30 a.m. till 10.30 p.m. and later. Um, and let's not forget Buffalo Logo and Apparel. Um, honest to God, one of the best spots to get any of your apparel needs when it comes to the Bills, the Sabres, all of your Buffalo sports needs. Um, they have a lot of cool stuff on there. The Zubas uh, uh, golf polo is one of my favorites. Uh, they have our merchandise on there. Um, made sure there was no dog hair on it this time. The uh, Sabres Hashik, uh embroidered uh, goaded hat. Um, they have the RJ1 too with the little broadcast uh, headset on the side. Uh, make sure you go check it out at Buffalo Logo Co. on Instagram and Twitter, buffalogo.com, at Fatty Beer on Instagram and Twitter, fattybeer.com. Sabres win um, in their season finale versus the Tampa Bay Lightning and Eric Comrie with. Uh, a fantastic game with possibly his NHL career on the line. Who knows? Um, and Dylan Cousin with two goals uh, in the win for Buffalo. Uh, Connor, just a, you know, a lot to digest here. But just your, if you could just put all of your thoughts about this season into a couple words. Not one word, but a couple words. What would they be? I would say it's not as bad as it seems. And I know that's tough for a lot of fans, given that they haven't made the playoffs in 13 years. But looking at this season in a vacuum, if their power play was even marginally better, and that if they had maybe a tiny bit of injury luck, whether that be for Tage or Alex Tuck or Jack Quinn, I do believe this team would have made the playoffs. And of course, that's would have, would, would have, could have, should have. Making excuses, you can, you can do all of that. But in the vacuum of this season alone. I really do believe that this team is not that far off. And that is very much determinant of what happens this summer. But it's not as bad as it seems. It's disappointing. Nonetheless, the expectations were high and they absolutely failed. But I really, really do believe that this team is way closer than a lot of fans would lead you to believe. I I agree with that to an extent. Um there were a lot of, uh, you know, in comments and group chats I've been in the past couple of days. Um, and one of the things I saw that kept coming up either in the chats or I see it on my timeline is, what if Jack Quinn didn't get hurt? What if we had Jack Quinn for the entire season? Um, the thing that irritates me about hearing stuff like that is, yeah, like their injuries happen, key players get hurt, but you find ways to get through it, right? Like you just, like your, your season shouldn't rely on a second year 21 year old player or however old he is 20 21 years old i can't remember how old he is he might even be younger than that like your season shouldn't rely on the shoulders of that kid because he was hurt for most of the year to me i mean yeah we make a good point maybe we sneak in with 91 or 92 points great but i think that where we really failed was outside of just on the ice was the people in charge of making decisions and i think that's where i feel the most let down is um for the first off season, this past off season, I felt like we had the most trust we had in a front office that we had in a while. And once again, they let us down. Yeah. It's pretty clear for, for a long time now that they needed more than Connor Clifton and Eric Johnson added to this bunch. I think they had more trust and faith in their forward group than they probably should have with the amount of goals that were scored last season with the amount of blowouts guys having career years, and clearly it didn't turn out that exact same way. They had 246 goals for this season, 244 goals against. So a plus two. And I think on the bright side, the 244 goals against is way better than it was last season. Yes. That's a, that's a, that's a big part of it being Uko Pakalukin and, and his ascension and how amazing he was. But I would say that the team defense not only – from the defenseman, but also the forwards was way better than it was last season. And it 
also on the other on the pessimistic side makes it pretty frustrating that you had a top eight goaltender performance this year in almost every single metric from goals save above expected goals against save percentage starts quality wins quality starts from upl and you still can't make the playoffs especially in a down year in the eastern conference so there's two sides of the same coin here uh, of course, it's really frustrating, and every single fan that's followed this team for a long time is deservedly upset. I, we're upset. Nobody's happy with this. But at the same time, this team still is is very young. They have a lot of talent, and I don't think the regression will be as bad next season as it was this season. And that's provided you add a few more pieces to the group, which we'll get into over the course of the next six months extensively, even the next three months before the draft and free agency happens. But yeah, it's, it's of course, really, really disappointing. But as I said earlier, I think you, there are a few things that you can look on the bright side and not get super angry because what's the point of that? Yeah. Uh, I must have missed this comment. Did Paul Hamilton say something about Jeff Skinner uh, during the, between this, uh, the second and third? I didn't, I didn't hear that. I mean, Paul's not on the, the ESPN Plus broadcast, so – Potentially, he said that on WGR. Uh, I haven't seen that. I, mean, I watched it. I watched the normal Sabres broadcast today. So is I is, is Paul on that though? Because I guess I I get the MSG broadcast on on ESPN Plus. Uh, so I'm Were not you, sure. So you, so you got Dunleavy on the call? Yeah, I, I get I get all of the. And he must have said I, something on GR then. Yeah, yeah um, I missed it. I was in and out. Um, a lot going on, but um, yeah, I uh, and. You get that from – I mean, I don't know if Paul Hamilton knows something. I mean, he is – he does cover the team extensively. Maybe he's heard something. I don't know. Um, you know, those guys like Ed GR, they're kind of in bed with the team in terms of making sure they're a bunch of yes men and not, you know, you're not, not pulling back the curtain too much, if, especially if they know something. Um, but there was a tweet earlier from Jimmy Murphy, Murphy's Law, I forget the exact handle. I put it in our chat about – it was just really random because it's not from a guy who covers the team. Um, so I'm assuming he's hearing something credible enough to kind of go on record, at least on Twitter. I mean, if you want to call that credible and said, they're expecting like really big changes coming with the Sabres this off season. Um, and that, you know, I would never say, I, I mean, I, you could think that with their end of season press conferences scheduled for what is it? Friday. Yeah. You would think that their jobs are probably safe, right? But we have seen in the past, you know, granted it was when Kim was, um, you know, running day-to-day operations of the team that they would tell a coach and a GM, yeah, your jobs are safe. And then a week later, you're fired. Or two weeks later, you're fired. So, I mean, I don't know what to take of that. Take it at face value. Is there, you think there's, anything i mean I'll, I'll bring up the tweet too if there's anything really to read into it that like it was just really random because again it's not from a guy it comes from a credible guy but he doesn't cover our team like who is he hearing this from yeah i'm not sure uh i, I would bring it up and i think that leads to a larger discussion if that is about coaching whether that's about players maybe even ownership uh i'm not really sure uh but when you miss the playoffs for 13 straight seasons, I think almost anything is on the table, especially given how difficult it's been financially, how difficult it's been from an attendance perspective, how difficult it's been in terms of arena reno- renovations. The state of this franchise right now is probably not as bad as it's ever been. When you think back to the Regis days and the fraud and the deception and everything else that that factored into the sale to, to Tommy Alisano, But at the same time, it's definitely not good. And I think everybody needs to be realistic about what potentially could happen in in any facet whatsoever. I think that you even see uh, we're not the Arizona Coyotes, but the Arizona Coyotes are moving to Utah. And which is which is which is just crazy to think about. But at the same time, it is a business in pro sports. So. I guess we'll see. I mean, from the on the ice perspective, I think we all know that. I think if Kevin Adams is still this GM, I think he knows what he needs to do this offseason to provide tangible change to get this team over the hump. 
And then off the ice, I'm not sure if off the ice would necessarily be related to a coach because that that's an on the ice factor. So that makes me think it could potentially be something else. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm not ruling anything out. I'm really not. And um, I'm quite frankly, really intrigued, in, intrigued to see what happens with the future of this franchise, yeah. because it potentially could signal a new direction. It could single, it could signal something that we haven't seen in a really long time. So yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily think this is 100% true, but at the same time, like it's definitely intriguing to say the least. Well, the reason I bring it up right after the Skinner comment too, is because he's, he, he goes out of his way to say both on and off the ice. On the ice, I mean, I think a pretty big change would be Jeff Skinner, right? Like he's been there for how long now? You know, I would I would say if he were to retire tomorrow, I mean, he played most of his career with the Sabers. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be a big change outside. I think of the obvious, you you would at least see the assistant coaches, you know, out the door come, you know, locker clean out there. You know, I, I mean, I imagine. We'll get that announcement on Friday, but like I think on the ice, I think the one thing I think of again having Hamilton say something like that, kind of like polarizing like that in between periods. Jeff Skinner is he on this team next year? I, I question it now with those yeah. two things coming one right after the other. Yeah, me too, and that really is kind of based on if a team is willing to take his contract or if the Sabres are willing to retain salary, obviously $8.59 million a year. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of money for, for a guy who's going to turn 32 pretty soon. So yeah, I, I think that is an interesting discussion. I mean, he's a Boston based reporter. I could see Jeff Skinner inserting himself into that Bruins lineup really well. I could see him potentially going back home to Toronto to play with a guy like Austin Matthews or Mitch Marner or John Tavares and just be that goal scoring guy that we know he still can be. I could see him going to any number of these playoff teams to hopefully finally give him a actual run at the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think that Skinner on the second line or even on the third line next season isn't, is the worst thing in the world for this team. If you put him in the correct role with the right guys around him, you know, he can still produce. He had a couple months this season where he was the best offensive player on the team and he was as good or even better than he's been in the past two or three years. So I think he's still got a lot left, especially the way he plays. He doesn't take much contact aside from the McKinnon hit this year, which I think kind of derailed his season a little bit. He wasn't quite the same after that. And he's largely been pretty healthy throughout his whole career. So it seems kind of like that was a freak accident from a really good player. So yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, But yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes on the ice. I think we've, we've both uh, settled on that. Um, from Big Fungus, I think the off the ice change is a proper president of hockey ops. I mean, I we wish and we really do, but I, I, like we can hope for that, right? Yeah, but Aaron Tim, when he had him on, he was pretty convinced it'll never happen. Yeah, so that's sort of what makes me believe that something higher than that. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess another, another thing too is you know. I mean, I've been pretty checked out the last two weeks. I'm not going to lie to you, Earls. Like, I barely watched this game tonight. Like, and I would say I've never been more ready for a season to end than I have been over the last few games. Even, like, a few games before they were, like, mathematically eliminated. Finally, like, it was kind of just been, like, I, I just want it over with. <laughs> like, the, I, I don't care about the draft. I don't – like, this is the first time going to draft. I just truly don't give a shit. I will. I will say I care a little bit more now that I've I watched the NCAA hockey tournament like pretty extensively. Yeah, that's a, great. I know. It doesn't. No idea. Yeah. Doesn't matter for us. But you don't want to use the pick. Like, no, no, no. We don't want to use the pick. Obviously, want to package it with a with a with some prospects or whatever. But the guy on Denver, the defenseman on Denver, uh, Zeev Bouliam, who mm-hmm. who just helped Denver beat the best team in the country. He's incredible and. Picturing him in the Sabres lineup it was really exciting for me, but this is like under the assumption that they don't make the pick as well. So there are really good prospects, and I think we'll we'll do our show when we we go through the draft because I think it still is exciting. There's a lot of really really good guys. 
let's say the Sabres win the lottery and draft Macklin Celebrini. Does that change the course of the Well, strategy? yeah, I mean, if you win the lottery, that's completely different for, for sure. For sure, for sure. But I'm just saying that, like, even if they do make the pick, of course, disappointing. But you're going to get a really good player. So, and even if they do make that pick, they could potentially trade that that player as well. So I I, I don't think it'd be the end of the world. But yeah, I mean, I, I like to watch each game from a clear lens, right? Like these guys are still giving it their all. And you saw that tonight. Like Dylan Cousins has obviously had a really frustrating year. The puck just wouldn't go in for him. I would say that there have been nights where he could have had two, three goals and he just had really, really horrible puck luck or the opposing goalie made incredible saves against him. And you saw last season, he scored 30 plus goals. So I think he had a really, really tough year, but you kind of saw tonight that it felt like he had something to prove that he felt like he was kind of sending a message, not only to the team, the organization, but even to fans that like, Hey, I still am this player. I, I am this person that can go out and take control of the game when I really want to. And I don't think it's a matter of want. Like I, I think the effort's been there this year. He just had a really, really tough year. And I do think that happens sometimes. So I, I think tonight was an encouraging sign. I also, I really don't think we got, everything that Tampa had to offer. And I do, there were a couple sequences out there where it was like, yeah, they were sloppy. They, they, they were, they were not checked out, but they were really playing a lot of guys out there playing to not get hurt before playoffs, put it that way. Like, yeah. you know I mean, like they weren't really finishing their checks. You know what I mean? They weren't going to the dirty no, areas that they normally can go to, but I, I wouldn't necessarily put too much into that because like we saw the Sabres beat so many good teams all season long. Oh and yeah, it, and it was the games He's that like Tampa twice this year now. Yeah, and it was the games that we expected them to win, where they would be down five nothing after the first period against the Senators. Mm-hmm. So I'm very, very confident this team can beat the best teams in the league. Not necessarily regularly, because of course the the results don't show that. But they they lost to the Anaheim Ducks twice. They lost to the Columbus Blue Jackets yeah. nine to four. They lost to the Senators a couple yeah. times. Uh, they lost to some pretty bad teams. And, of course, that really, really hurts when you look at mm-hmm. probably missing the playoffs by five, five, six points. But at the end of the day, the, the biggest thing was the power play. And I think that does come down to coaching, and that does come down to scheme. And you're going to need to get guys in there that actually know what they're doing and can be creative and be willing to switch it up when something's not working. What's our solution to the power play? So uh, power play looks feeble. Um well, new coaching for sure. I think again, we look at upper management. It just it blows my mind that even like twenty games into the season, we saw how bad it was, how bad it was, and nothing changed. Nothing was done. We still, for whatever reason, didn't really. I mean, outside of their attempts to go sign Patrick Kane, like there was really no solution to that. And you know, we know what. Jack Quinn brings uh, from a, from a power play standpoint, his shot, his skill set. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I just there was just nothing at all done to fix that situation because that was a big part of our you know our scoring surges last year was just our ability to dominate on the power play. I think we had a top five a uh, top five unit last year, or our first unit at least. Like, it was almost unstoppable at times. And just yeah. not seeing anything done, man. It was just, just that that they go back to my point, like just being let down by the management we thought we were had faith in to start the season. Yeah, I think specifically with the power play, the two biggest is, issues were were zone entry and lack of movement once they actually got possession in the zone. More often than not, teams would stack the blue line and they would try to carry it in, and they would bang their head against the wall and they would throw it down the ice. There's, there was never a concerted effort to enter the zone uh, either with speed coming down to retreat for puck retrieval in the defensive zone to eventually get possession, or there wasn't enough controlled entry when teams were backing off a little bit. Yeah. To, for the power play to, to be successful, you need possession in the zone. And part of that is obviously your zone entry and getting there in the first place. And more often than not, especially even in the neutral zone when they were down in games, even at even strength, teams would clog it up because they know that the Sabres had no solution to team stacking the the blue line with defenders and even offensive players and penalty killers. So, as I said, the, the willingness to look at problems and find solutions, send a guy in with speed and dump it in and try to gain possession that way. Send two guys in. 
You don't always need to do that back pass in the neutral zone. You don't always need to just try to carry it in and dangle past somebody at the blue line. Yeah. It's not going to work. So, yeah, and, and in, even in the zone. I think we saw a little bit later in the year when Stani took over, there was more motion on the power play. There was more creativity. There were guys in front of the net. They were tipping pucks. They were getting rebounds in. But before that, it was just let's pass it over to Tage and try a one-timer and get it blocked seven out of ten times. Or pass it up to Darlene, uh, who's quarterbacking the top, but he doesn't have any options because people are so stationary. So those two things specifically need to be fixed. And uh, I think if you get a guy in with power play experience who's done it in the league for a long time, of course, that's you know that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but those guys are out there. I think that could really help. Mm. Um, I don't know. I know I, I tweeted out, too, that we're going to do some, like, end-of-season reward awards. I mean, we could do those right now if you'd like. Uh, the, the, the chat's filling up quite a bit. But um, if you were to name an unsung hero of this team, if you can, who is who is it? Unsung hero. Uh, I'll go Greenway. I think in the games that John Greenway played and in the role that was best for him, which is a middle six role, middle six to bottom six, penalty killer, a tough physical presence, I thought he had a really good year. And he had some timely goals. He had some timely assists. Even if you saw tonight on the penalty kill, uh, poking the puck away and getting into Cousins in front. There were many plays like that all season long. And the definition of unsung is a guy that you don't necessarily think of that had a pretty good impact. And I, I would say Greenway, uh, given the fact that he wasn't great in the top line role that they forced him into when they when they put him with with Tage and Tuck. But on the penalty kill, he was one of the better, better penalty killers in the league. And in a middle six to bottom six role, he not only produced, but he provided the toughness. He provided the defense. He, he was responsible in his own end. So I would go with Greenway for, for that award. So I, I myself, I'm going to go with JJ Paterka. Um, I don't think anybody expected him to break out the way he did this season. Um, multiple times he led this team in scoring. Um, and when he was finally given a chance to be like a mainstay in the top line, like kind of saw, you know, we, we, we had struggles to find really a cohesive unit uh, for that first line because just things didn't seem to click with uh, Tuck Thompson Skinner a lot this season, whether it was due to injury or not, like it just wasn't working for most, for the most part. And you put JJ Paterik up there and things just again cohesive, you know, they're dominant. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go JJ Paterik. Um, biggest surprise. Hmm. Biggest surprise. Get going a lot of different directions with this one. For sure. And I, I don't want to be negative. Uh, so I'll say, Paterka just strictly from a goal scoring perspective. I, I would say that we all thought he absolutely could get 20, but to get to close to 30 and to do it in the way that he did scoring goals, not only dirty goals, but really, really nice goals, especially with his shot. I think a lot of people were surprised with how good of a shot he had and his speed is really incredible. And of course that contributed to a lot of his goals, but I would say his goal scoring specifically. And that was, playing on a line with Dylan Cousins, who wasn't himself for most of the year. If you put him with a healthy Tage and Tuck to begin next year and they keep this momentum from the end of the season going, I could easily see 35 goals from, from J.J. Paterka next season. So that was, uh, that was a bit of a surprise, but it was a welcome one, and it was one that kept them competitive throughout the year. I'm going to go Zach Benson. Um for an undersized, I mean, five foot ten, 170 pounds, 18 year old kid, who nobody expected to make the team this season. Uh, 71 games played, 11 goals, 30 points. It's a minus, a dash three, but I mean, a lot of guys were on, on that side of the, you know, the, the, uh, the scorecard uh, this year, but um, in the negative. But I, I was impressed with what I saw from Zach Benson. Um, and Rob Ray made a good point during the broadcast. He never played himself out of a roster spot on this team. Constantly going in. It was the one guy, one of maybe two guys in this team that was constantly going to the net, played a very fearless style of hockey, made mistakes. Cause yeah, cause he's a rookie and rookies are going to make mistakes. Connor Bedard made a lot of mistakes this year. Like he was, he's supposed to be the next Crosby or the next big David. Um, he made a lot of mistakes this year because you're rookies and you're going to. Um, but a 30 point rookie season, I'm pretty impressed by that. 
um, for a kid that none of us had pegged to make this team this year at all. So I'm going to go record. Zach Benson. Let the record show up. Let the record show after the draft. I said he was going to make the team. Who you did? I did. You did. Uh, I got to see tweets. I got to see. No, tweets. no, no. I said it. I said it on the show after we drafted. Oh, you got to clip that. I got to find yeah, it. Then I that. said there was a very good chance that he was going to make the team. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, I have, no, I have, I have no, I have no reason to lie about that. <laughs> <laughs> the tool man, the ultimate tool man on the team, the guy who brings everything to the table. Um, Tim, like Tim, the tool man, Taylor, who, uh, who brought everything to the table, every single game you can put out there in any situation and you can rely on him. I think we all know who this is. It's, it's Rasmus Dallin. He does everything. He's a top five defenseman in the league. In, in my view, he is. Not only really, really responsible in his own end, and he's much better defensively than he once was, especially as an 18-year-old, a little bit undersized coming into the league. But his physical presence has improved. He's responsible in front of his own net. His puck retrievals and his zone exits and zone entries are incredible. I, I would say they're as good as Kel McCarr. And he also scored 20 goals this season, 59 points. Uh, not as many points as he's had in the past, but that's largely because the power play wasn't that great. But having him as your solidified number one defenseman for the next 10 years, he's going to be your future captain. I'm sure they'll name him the captain right before the season this season, uh, coming up next year in September, October. He's the guy that, that does everything. I think there were certain nights at one point in the year he was playing 30-plus minutes, uh, which has basically never been done before. It hasn't been done in a really, really long time. They were <laughs> – Riding him into the ground, but after every game, Granada was like, yeah, it's because he's a horse and he can do it. So it really speaks to not only his cardio, but how smart he is, his hockey IQ, everything. He, I think, is a bona fide superstar, and that is the best thing for this team moving forward that they have that. So I could have went in, and I agree with all of that. Um, just I had Darlene picked, too. Like that's where we were the same too. 20 goals a season again, didn't what wasn't the most points he's had in a season, but I think that he proved a lot this year of any situation. He can play it. He can do it. Um, just to go against the green for you here though, I'm going to go Jordan Greenway. Um, Jordan Greenway was asked to do a lot of different jobs this year, play the PK. He played on the power play. He even played at the first line multiple times this year. Um, and there was never a game I came out of thinking, Wow, like, why was Jordan Greenway out there? What, what you know, you know, why is he on this team? Um, I liked him a lot this season. Again, I I call him the ultimate tool man. He has every tool in the toolbox that you ask of a player, um, of his caliber, where you expect him to play in your lineup. And it, I think every team wants a guy like Jordan Greenway on their team, just because of size and skill and just overall ability to just contribute and. Any way you ask of him. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go Jordan Greenway there. Not a bad choice. Yes. So um next, before we get to the most valuable player, we're gonna go to the least valuable player. Who is your LVP of this team? And again, you can go in a lot of different directions. That's tough. That's really, really tough. And it hurts to say because like you don't want to uh, you don't want to kick a guy while he's down. Uh, but at the same time, I think the second line center is really really important to this team. And I think he would even say it himself. Uh, it's I think it's pro this season specifically. I think it's got to be Cousins, given the fact that number one he has the contract. Number two he had the production last year, and number three how important that role is to this team. And he was largely healthy, I would say, for most of the year, whereas Alex Tuck and Tage Thompson weren't. So I would, and given he also has some experience under his belt, I think this is either his third or fourth full season in the league. So he's not necessarily super young anymore. And he said it himself that it was a really, really disappointing year for him. Mm -hmm. And this summer is super important for him to not only work on his goal scoring, but maybe get a little bit tougher, get a little, get a little bit bigger. And so he can play the way that he played tonight. And I know nobody wants to hear this is something to build on. But at the same time, it's good to see that he can still be that player that we all knew 
last season and even before that. Uh, my first memory of him was that outdoor game in Toronto when he was going at Austin Matthews and he got in that fight. Yeah. And he was outside of the glass, banging on the glass uh, like he was in the Mighty Ducks. Like Dylan Cousins, I believe, still has a really, really bright future. But this season was disappointing for him, for sure. And had he had five, ten more goals, maybe a presence on the power play, maybe even a little bit better in his own zone. He had a tough giveaway uh, against the Panthers the other night in overtime where he was just a little bit weak on his stick, which I think was emblematic of a lot of his play this season. I think the season could have been much different. But by no means do I say him being the LVP this season – means that he's a bust or he's done for the future. I still have high hopes for Dylan Cousins, and I think tonight was uh, a good sign moving forward. I would say you made a good point for for Dylan Cousins to definitely be the LVP of this team. Um, And he's definitely in the conversation for me, but um, I'm going to go Peyton Krebs. Peyton Krebs uh, for, what, about 20 games? Nearly 20 games was given an opportunity to step into a role as a third line center and did absolutely nothing with it. Nothing. Had a few flashes where he looked okay, you know, but was given an opportunity to really step into Casey middle stat skates and maybe try and make a case for us to not make a move for a third line center in the off season or not to look one of to one of the prospects to maybe fill that role. And now we're left with more questions and answers. And I think that Peyton Krebs is a guy that's, Definitely going to be on the outside uh, looking in, for sure. Um, we got some comments in here. Uh, Corbin Snyder, Victor Olsen, Eric Kami tied for Afterthought Award. Um, from uh, Colin Smith, biggest surprise, 10,000% is UPL. Um, yeah, you, again, you could have went a lot of different directions with a lot of those different categories, but in terms of LVP, it's it's Peyton Krebs for me. I, he, he just... He, he found a way to contribute less this year than he did last year, which is yeah, surprising. For sure. Uh, for sure. And I do believe that, uh, yeah, definitely disappointing. But in a similar vein, I'm not going to give up on him quite yet. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what they, they do this offseason in terms of the forward group. But I think he's young enough. And I think the flashes that we've seen, especially from a playmaking perspective, I still think he has that element of his game. I don't necessarily think he's ever going to be a 20 goal scorer, but he does have that spark in terms of setting guys up. And he does have the jam as we've seen in terms of getting to the corners and being tough and physical. So yeah, I'm still hopeful uh, even though it didn't seem like he really took, took the reins, as you said, with the opportunity he was given. Yeah. Uh, and even before that, man, like I just, you never found yourself talking about Peyton Krebs in almost any game this season. And that guy, you know, at least when that trade was made, was the centerpiece of that trade. It was Peyton Krebs. So like, you know, that's the guy they held out for. That's the guy they wanted. You know, out of their, all their prospects was Peyton Krebs. And we've seen little to nothing of him other than a few fights here and there. And just to your point, some jam, which is great from a guy that wasn't involved with the biggest trade in your franchise's history. Um and not a former first round pick, but I, I just, to me, it's, he's on the outside looking in for me this off season, without a doubt. Um, you have to make room for prospects that want to make the jump to the NHL. You have to make room for guys that you're going to acquire via trade or free agency. That's the guy for me. That's on the outside looking in. Nobody else is Peyton Krebs. He's playing for his roster spot, you know, this coming off season and preseason, if he's even still here. Just yeah. my opinion. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, let's see. And we'll go to our most valuable player. And I think we'll both probably have the same guy on this one. But I'll let you go first. Uko Pekka, look at it. <laughs> yeah, the video Uko I use that. I think that's I think it's the video I use more than anything anything else this season was Henry Yoki Haru uh in his very, very finished voice, uh screaming Uko Pekka Luke in his name in the locker room before a game when they read the lineup cards this season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say it's a surprise for sure, uh, given that he started the season as their third goalie, not even in the in the lineup on opening night. But goalies are weird, and we could say that as, as much as anybody because we are, we are goalies, and we know that the development for any goalie in the National Hockey League is usually not linear. 
And I would say that the mistakes that they made with Devin Levi to begin the year uh, are not only similar, but a little bit ironic in the, in the sense that they brought on UPL a little bit slower. He had a really, really good stretch last season. Uh, I think on a road trip, he won four straight games uh, against the, the Vegas oh, Knights, the Avalanche. And there it is. Uh, but you saw flashes, right? But there was never the consistency. And he also had, I think, eight or nine uh, goals saved, saved below expected last season. But to play 54 games, which is, I would say, way more than anybody thought, a 27-22-4 and four record, 2.57 goals against, and a 9-10 save percentage in today's NHL when goal scoring has increased for the most part is really, really, really good. I think it was 26 of 27 games at one point from late December to early March that he gave up three goals or less. And he was starting almost every single night. He was a horse. And not only was he making the big saves that he needed to, but he was consistent. And that was the thing that everybody needed to see from him. We all know his tools. We all know his size. We all know his pedigree, winning the World Junior Championship with Finland. And he was the mm -hmm. OHL goalie of the year. And he was a second round pick. And he was the savior that all these Sabres fans thought for a really long time. But this year, he finally showed it. And I am extremely confident that he can be a number one starting caliber goalie in this league for years to come. So he's the MVP. And in my opinion, both him and Levi moving forward, combined with Deline, are, are the reasons this team should be re like not as down in the dumps as a lot of fans should be right now. There's a lot to look forward to, and you can look right in that with uh, with Uko Pekka. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that statement. And your answer is the same as mine. We're going to go to it right here. Uko Right, it's incredible. It, it, that that's a beauty. That's a beauty. Um, you you guys could hear it, right? Yeah, I mean, I heard it, so okay, I'm sure make everybody else heard it. Yeah, a UPL. Um, you just went down his stat line. Um, easily could have been the biggest surprise. Could have been an unsung hero, but easily your MVP, right? Like he's just he was the whole reason from January on that you had an opportunity to even you talked about the playoff conversation um, without him. You're probably looking at a top five pick this season. Let's be yeah. real with how bad this team was. Um, and I think that's why, again, I'm more concerned than I am optimistic this off season, depending on what the moves that Kevin Adams decides to make is that, you know, without that goaltender, <laughs> we're talking, we went, we really are talking about Celebrini. <laughs> we really are like, we're we're hoping and praying that we're come draft lottery night that we're that that you know we're gonna be down to those one of those last three balls those lottery balls so I uh but I'm glad too that we're not in that conversation because then we'd still be talking about who's the goaltender we'd still be talking about you know goalies this off season free agency draft like who who's the guy gonna be are we gonna start Levi next season who like now there's just more optimism than it has ever been going into next season when it comes to the gold hunting position. And, you know, do you probably want them to go get a veteran to play behind UPL? Sure. But if, if would you be comfortable with it being UPL and Levi next year? I absolutely would be given Agreed. how good Levi has been in the AHL. And also given, you know, his injury history, you know, that he had double hip surgery. You don't want to overwork him. He obviously mm -hmm. proved this year that he could, but then you add another season onto that, and that can change things, at least physically. So you don't want to overwork this guy. And playing him 50, 55 games next season, I think, is is not without of the question, especially if he's healthy and he keeps up this pace. But then you give Levi 30 games. You, you, you work him back in in a way that's smart and intelligent and also factors into his development because you don't want him sitting too much. Even if it's 45 and 35, find a split that works for this team because you know that they're confident in both guys. Yes. Obviously, Levi had some tough games here and there, but he also had a lot of really good games as well. So you let Levi go on this Calder Cup run. You give them both some work this summer. You you let them develop even more. And you come into training camp with a 1A and 1B, or even a 1 and a very, very solid 2. And then you go from there. As, as Ardo O'Kell said to us the other night, 
it would be way more depressing. And even as you just said, if we didn't have a more optimistic view in net. And the only times this team has ever been good in their history is when they've had a really good goaltender. Obviously, everything else yep. factors into it. But it is one of the more important things in hockey to have confidence in your back end, have confidence that the guy can make the big save, high danger chances, and the ability of this team can open up and go down to the offensive end and score goals. So it is obviously very concerning that they couldn't make the playoffs with that. But at the same time, it's better than not having it. And you can be optimistic and hopeful and confident about that moving forward. You want to know who my MVP is? This guy, Mauricio Arenas. He's been there on the, on us on the post game for, I'd say, most of the games we've we, we, we've uh, covered. And he always has no punctuation. You know, it's hard to decipher sometimes what he has to think. But it, overall, I think Mauricio does know hockey. And um, he is passionate, just like we are. And for whatever reason, man, he thinks you're just a California surfer who just gets all the girls. Who could, all, who could also be a power play specialist, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not qualified for that. I've got some good ideas, but I would have no idea how to verbalize them to an NHL hockey team. Uh, me either. Um, all of them re- unsung hero, Mike Bell's goaltending coaching. What about PT? PK I, I, again <laughs> part time uh, okay part time part, part time coach defense he's talking Girardi about Girardi, fire Girardi. his ass Ellis can go couch coach Pee Wee Bantam League in Northwest at, Territory Arctic I love it I love it I mean, it's love it's it. hap- it's happened enough now that we can decipher the acronyms we can decipher good. it and I I love it though it's a, I it's appreciate it. and yeah I, and as as you said the uh the discussion, the discourse, uh, the passion is, is what keeps this going. It's what it's what started it for all of us. And I think it's what uh, keeps it going for all of you. As, as Ted Lasso says, it's it's the hope that kills you. But at the same time, I think it's the hope that keeps you going. And it's the mm-hmm. hope that this team finally figures it out and ends this drought at 13 years. Lucky number 13. I'm confident they will. And I think there's no point in being more negative than we already are. There's so much negativity surrounding this team. There's so much online. There's so much in the media. There's so much in other podcasts that that cover this team that I think there are reasons to to be hopeful and there are reasons to be positive mm-hmm. about a very young team that obviously disappointed this season. But what's the use in in kicking them while they're down? We can we can look at the positives and try to move forward and identify what they need to do to get to the point where we're fighting for a playoff spot or we're comfortably in one at this time next year expectations for Friday's press conference before we get out of here? I think that Adams and Granado do keep their jobs. Uh, I think Granado would have been gone by now if he wasn't going to keep his job going into next season. And I think Ad- Adams absolutely keeps his job. Not only because I don't think he's necessarily been horrible, but this team does need a direction that has oversaw – this prospect system and these draft picks and these trades leading into such an important offseason. So I'm at least excited to see what he's going to do because he has been pretty good, not only drafting, but with trades in the past. Of course, it's easier said than done, and not every trade is going to be perfect. But at the same time, we talk about all of the prospects that they have, all of the picks that they have, the ability and the cap space as well, the ability to package prospects picks cap space whatever whatever you need to get guys out bring guys in and try this thing again with a different look to it so mm-hmm. yeah i i think there's going to be a lot of that type of talk yeah we're going to make some changes obviously this was disappointing the expectations were high and we still have this on those same expectations but tangibly as you said i i i would hope that they announce that the uh there's going to be a new assistant coaching staff I'm not sure if they will. And that might happen at some point later in the summer. I think or even question's going to get asked. Yeah, the question, and they might say, oh, we're going to evaluate everything. There's, I think there's going to be a lot of non-answers, as there always are at these things. But I think that either will be announced hopefully on Friday, and if not, then probably at some point in the summer. Probably get like that notification on Twitter from, you know, Lance Lyasowski or whomever is going to be, you know, Ellis, Christy, and... 
Marty Wolford out as Durano's assistants. Um, and unfortunately, you had a, a great a great assistant coach, as we've seen in what he's done with the now President Trophy winning Rangers in your system, and could have been on your bench, but you know. Yeah, it's neither here nor there. That's in the past. So you got to try and forget about that one. Maybe it'll be Jay McKee. We'll see. I don't know. Uh, Jay McKee has been had a ton of success in the OHL. Um, used to coach Connor McDavid. Um, we'll see what happens. I know he's been very comfortable with this position. Um, I think he's still with Erie. I want to say he's with, still with the Erie Otters. I, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe it'll be that guy. Who knows, man? All I know is, you need at least one former NHL coach on the bench with Granado next year if Granado is the guy. It, it can't be a bunch of first-time NHL assistant coaches. You need experience around him. You need someone that Granado can lean on. I don't think it would be Lindy. You know what I mean? Like, could you imagine, man, if we got to fucking Friday and <laughs> Kevin Adams gets up there and Lindy Ruff sits down next to him? As we said, just as cool, just as cool as it would have been to see him coach against the Devils. That would be. Oh, dude, could you? That would insert a shot of adrenaline into this fan base. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Sabers Twitter wouldn't know what to think, man. They would have an absolute meltdown. It it, it would be nuts. It'd Honestly, be nuts. maybe that's what's necessary. But not only do you need experience behind the bench, you need experience in your lineup, and. Quite frankly, you need experience in the in the general manager's box too. I think we all think that a president of hockey operations is necessary. I think the uh, scouting department, the analytics department, I think they've added to that, and I think they're doing a pretty good job. Especially given that we've got we've had the number one ranked prospect system for the past five years running now. But uh, yeah, in terms of the results on the ice, of course, you need experience in your lineup. You need proven guys, and you need experience behind the bench to help lead them as well. So, I. Uh, if we can identify that, hopefully they'll be able to as well. Uh, from Corbin Snutter, didn't Bruce Cassidy get canned after having his press conference with the Bruins? He did. He did. So never say never, even if they're having an end-of-season press I would, conference. I would never say never with anything related to this franchise right now. I, given that Pagula Sports and Entertainment folded recently, given all the changes that we've seen, not only with the Sabres, upper management and business, but with the bills as well, like there's a lot going on right now. And I think there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that we don't even know about. So I think we can look at this off season with a clean slate and honestly be prepared for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is kind of exciting in a sense, given that we haven't made the playoffs in 13 years, might as well try something new. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily know anything tangible, but at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if anything were to happen. So let's, uh, let's go day by day, and we'll, and we'll see. From James Patrick Crean, Pagula has fired many after the year end presser. It's definitely happened. My um, uh, shout out, shout out, Jimmy Crean, my former uh, hockey coach at Cas, senior year of high school. Go. We, uh, we made it all the way to the state championships. Had a great year down in South Buffalo. Uh, thanks for listening to the show, Jimmy. But uh, yeah, and that's the thing about Pagula. <laughs> I, I think especially right now, given the situation with Kim, given the new stadium with the Bills and everything surrounding that, I really do believe anything is on the table. So uh, we'll see what happens. For sale? I don't know. I really don't. Uh, but I mean, I, they're fixing I, the roof and they're, they're, I, in there, they are putting a new scoreboard. Yeah, I, I, I'll say this. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but at the same time, that is a huge, massive undertaking. And that, and I think more than anything, Pugula knows that if he were to sell the team, that it would have to be the somewhat, to someone that would sign a contract, sign any type of legal guarantee that they wouldn't move the team. So, yeah, just like Galasano. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm but, assuming I mean, Galasano that's, probably made him the same type of deal because he knew how important it was to the area. That's that's happened before, though. And there's a history of that in sports. Uh, the, the Sonics sold to Clay Bennett. Uh, he was, no, they sold to the Starbucks owner. And then he sold them to Clay Bennett, who was an Oklahoma, Oklahoma City businessman. And there was an exchange and there was a variety of information that was out there in the public. And then he immediately turned around and moved the team to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. So you can have as many guarantees as you want, but you can never be super sure. So 
that would have that's a different discussion for another day. But yeah, obviously this team matters a lot to the city. It matters a lot to the region. It matters a lot to the economy. And uh, I just want to see it in the best position possible. I think everybody can agree. Agreed. Um, wrapping up here, final thoughts. Um, I'll start first. I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody who's really stuck with us this year. Um, every single, you know, I go into the comments section here during every show and I see one or two new followers, new listeners, new viewers. Um, yeah, and I see the subscribers that keep on showing up on YouTube. Uh, you know, before I you know, make sure you subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Leave a comment. Good or bad, we, we, we can accept criticism. So, um, but please, please, please uh, continue to continue to show support. Uh, it means a lot because, you know, this is a, this is more more or less a hobby for us. And, you know, even with the sponsorships, man, like we spend a lot of time grinding at this and we wouldn't do it if we didn't have the support that you guys give us. So big shout out to you guys. You guys are all the real MVPs. A couple clicks for all of you and just, um, you know, it's not the end of I'll hang up and listen. It's not the end of two goalies one Mike this year. There's still a lot to come. Just obviously not three or four times a week. Good. Uh, obviously, there not being any more games. You know, we're we're going to cover the playoffs. Going to cover the draft. We're going to cover the press conference. Got some stuff in the works that maybe we might do a live show from a fatty beer company or uh, location. Might do like a, a Sabres town hall type thing, you know, where we do them with the state of the Sabres. Um, I do have a couple people that are interested in being a part of that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be, a, a fun off season. Um, we're not going anywhere. So yeah, I just appreciate all the, the support you guys have given us this season. Um, especially with what the expectations were and what ended up happening. So we wouldn't be able to get through stuff like this if it wasn't for all you guys. So shout out to you guys. You guys are the real MVP, unless you're Mauricio. Uh, surf's up, dude. Hurls is an MVP. <laughs> How about Final you? thoughts for you, Hurls? No, I, I echo that. I, I think this has been really cool for me, looking at the team in a different lens. Obviously, I've, I've been a diehard fan my entire life, but being a part of Sabres Twitter, being a part of the online discussions, uh, meeting new people uh, in in a sense that they've also gone through similar experiences as we have is, is really cool. And it makes you realize why you got into this in the first place and and why you still care why you watch a random game on a Tuesday night and you're, and you're screaming at your TV, jumping up and down for an overtime goal. Uh, it may seem trivial in the moment, but it is something that's larger than all of us. And it, it means family. It means friendship. It means everything in between. So as frustrating and disappointing as it is, it truly will make it that much better when they finally do get over the hump, when they finally go on a run again, when we can go out to the party in the plaza, when we can be a ballyhoo before a playoff game and you can feel that energy around the city there when not only Bill's flags are hanging on houses, but Sabres flags too. And I, I really don't think we're that far off from that point. Of course you can look at it in the lens of 13 years, but I prefer to be a little bit more optimistic and think that this team had some bad luck this season and they're still very young with a lot of talent and they're not that far off. And with a few really smart and intelligent intelligent changes this offseason, I think they can get over the hump. I really do believe that and I'm I'm excited to see it. We'll be here for all 82 games next season too and hopefully a few more than that. So I'm uh I'm hopeful. I'm I'm an optimistic person when it comes to Buffalo sports and any of my sports teams, but I think that is a way more healthy way to be than just being negative about it all because there's a lot of negativity to go around already. So you might as well be hopeful. So yeah, I appreciate you guys. It's been a lot of fun and uh, yeah, we'll keep it going here in the summer. Yeah. I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, appreciate the comment there, big fungus. Um, uh, as always, again, thank you so much. Last, last, last in season comment here from Mauricio. I care bleed blue and gold French connection and Leafs land below Leafs below. Um, yeah, I, I, and again, I re, re echo what you said. You obviously articulate it better than I do, but um, I'm glad you came on with us this year, Hurls. Um, you know, I grand slam for a pick for my new co-host. It's been it's been fantastic. Um, I, I'd love to know how many actually post games we covered. Um, would you say north of sixty? 
had has to be. I I know you have for sure. I think I've I probably did fifty plus. I would say uh, it's tough on the weekend sometimes, but uh, I know I know you you've done at least sixty five, <laughs> maybe more. Yeah, been, which is I mean the West Coast is obviously tough, but uh, yeah, I might could, have done a couple West Coast games. We could uh, uh we could figure something out for that next season too, given given that I'm out here. So. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, yeah, you can run that. I'll try and stay up. But you with the uh, with the three people up. listening out here, I would I would love to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um it's been a lot of fun, and uh, even even that episode we did with, with Arda on Thursday, I thought that was one of our our better discussions. Arda lo- Arda loves us too. He wants to come back on. Yeah, um, one of our best discussions yet, and I think there's a lot more of that to come in the future uh, as we continue to expand our profile and uh, yeah, with the help of all of you as well. That's what keeps this yeah. type of thing going. So yeah, looking forward to it onward and upward. We are, we march on the war path continues. Yeah. And I'm going to reach out to Harrington to come back on with us very soon. Fairburn, um, along with some other guests too, uh, here at the end of the season. So, um, that being said, guys, this has been, I'll hang up and listen, brought to you by fatty beer company, Western New York's premier market and tap room with over 300 beers to choose from at eight different Western New York locations. Fatty Beer is one of Western York's only kid and dog friendly buyers with live music, entertainment, and trivia all day locations open 11:30 a.m. until 10:30 p.m. and later. Fuck yeah, I got that done perfectly. And Buffalo Go Apparel. Uh, whether you're a Bills fan, a Sabres fan, or just a Buffalo sports fan in general, support all the teams. Buff- BuffaloGo.com carries all of the best when it comes to your local designs, our designs. Um, you know, they have a pretty cool Zubas, uh, golf polos out right now. The Buffalo master shirts and hats. Make sure you go check them out at buffalogo.com, um, at Buffalo Go co on Instagram and Twitter at fatty beer on Instagram and Twitter. Make sure you give them a follow. Tell them boys from two goalies. One Mike sent you, um, they'll take care of you over there. I am Dwayne for Connor Hurley. Uh, this has been, I'll hang up and listen. We will talk to you guys later. And as always, go Sabres.